Welcome to the 2019 Online Rules Presentation. My name is Charlie Winsky, Assistant Commissioner of the South Carolina High School League. I'm going to spend time going through the first part of the presentation with you, and then I'm going to turn it over to your Sport Commissioner to take care of the NFHS rules. The first part of this presentation will deal with South Carolina High School League rules and regulations that are pertinent information for you as a head coach. Some of the information we're going to go through is going to be old information for you, while some of it's going to be brand new information. The old information that we're going through are either requirements that you must follow as coaches or rules that we're seeing broke, broken consistently in the last few years. Please share this information with any of your assistant coaches or anyone that assists with your program to make sure that your program stays in compliance with the league rules and regulations. Coaching requirements. All coaches every year must go through the NFHS courses, the concussion course, heat acclimatization course, sudden cardiac arrest course. New for the 2019-20 school year is protecting students from abuse course. All four of those courses can be found at nfhslearn.com. Every coach in your program from volunteer to paid must go through that course each year prior to coaching in a practice or contest. As a reminder, all coaches must be CPR and AED certified. This must be done every two years. Your certification for both CPR and AED is a two-year certification. So please check with your athletic director or your certification cards to see if you're due for a new certification for this school year. Sportsmanship. League office, we continue to see issues with sportsmanship by players and by coaches. We want to take some time this year in our rules presentation to put some questions to you coaches to get you to think about some things as it pertains to your team and your behavior for sportsmanship. One of the first things we want you to think about is how often do you discuss this with your team? Do you make sportsmanship a priority? Do you take time each day to go through with your athletes, your expectations, how you want them to handle adverse situations? Or do you put it on the back burner and let it become a reaction when it happens? If you put it on the back burner and let it become a reaction when it happens, you know there's a high chance that the result is not going to be what you expect. Understand too, we're working with teenage athletes. No matter how much you go over something and how clearly you set your expectations, you're still going to run into a situation where a kid's going to make a poor decision. What we don't want is one kid's poor decision to lead into multiple kids' poor decisions and have multiple kids ejected from a contest due to one incident. We continue to see an increase in team displays of poor, poor sportsmanship throughout the year. One kid making a mistake is one thing. Multiple kids making the same bad decision at the same time escalates the situation tremendously. Take time, discuss this with your team, set your expectations, let them know what will and will not be tolerated. Two other questions we want you to think about is if your team doesn't win, and obviously everybody wants to be a winner, and everybody wants to win every time you step foot on the competition field or court, but if you're not to win, or if you are to win, how do you want people to remember your teams? When the game's over, during the season, when you leave the sporting event, years to come, how do you want people to remember your teams? Obviously, everybody wants them to remember their teams as playing hard, consistently playing hard, giving it their all, all the coach speak you can throw out. But what is it about their character you want people to remember? No matter how difficult the situation was, they held their heads high and handled it well. Or do you want people to remember that whenever something went wrong or whenever there was a chance, they showed poor displays of character and poor displays of sportsmanship? You set the tone. You're the leader. You lead them in drills. You lead them in team activities. You lead them through contest. You also lead them down the correct path of sportsmanship. Take time to, to speak to your team about sportsmanship daily. Make this part of what you do. Make this part of your culture and your expectations. And remember, sports, they don't build character, they reveal it. 
What character will you and or your players reveal when times get tough? What character will you reveal when things are going your way? It's all part of the educational-based athletics process. Teaching skills, winning, developing the athlete, developing the person. Sportsmanship falls under the ladder, developing the person. This is something they can carry with them as they go through life. Make it a priority each day to set your expectations on sportsmanship. Okay, athlete ejections. If you have an athlete ejected, remember, they can remain in the bench area during the contest. This becomes a supervision issue. If, if you ever have an official or someone that tells you your athlete has been ejected, they must leave the facility, they must leave the venue, that is not correct. Athletes are allowed to stay in the bench area if they've been ejected. They cannot return to play, but they can stay in the bench area provided they do not become a hindrance in the remainder of the contest. Also remember, any athlete in, in, ejected from a contest becomes immediately ineligible. They will remain ineligible to compete until they've been cleared by the league office. And cleared means serving their suspension. Failure to do so will result in you playing an ineligible athlete. Some changes this year to length of suspensions. Football, swim, lacrosse, and cheer will remain at one, as it has been for many years. Golf, volleyball, and wrestling, because they use play dates and not number of contests, will remain at two. New this year is a three-game suspension. This is the minimum. We've increased the number of games allowed in these sports. Therefore, we feel like the percentage needs to go up. The executive committee changed this this past May. The sports of basketball, baseball, softball, tennis, and soccer. An ejected athlete will carry a minimum three-game suspension during the regular season. These minimums, the one, two, and three games for the sports, are during the regular season. If you look down at the bottom, playoffs have been changed to where an ejection in the playoffs carries a minimum next game suspension. So your minimums of one game, two games, and three games in the respective sports are for the regular season. Should you get ejected in the playoffs, all sports fall under a minimum next game. Understand these games are set at the minimum. If you are ejected and it is a severe ejection, you're not going to get the minimum. If your ejection is a minor ejection or a routine ejection, chances are it's going to be set the minimum. I can tell you coaches to share with your athletes, disrespectfully addressing a game official is not going to get you the minimum. Disrespectfully addressing a game official is going to exceed the minimum. So if you're in the sport of basketball, baseball, softball, tennis, or soccer, and you disrespect a game official, you're going to get more than three games. In golf, volleyball, and wrestling, you're going to get more than two dates. In football, swim, lacrosse, and cheer, you're going to get more than one because those are minimum. A reminder, the ejections are served at the level the ejection occurs. If you're ejected from a sub-varsity contest, you must sit the, the number of games you're suspended for at the sub-varsity level. And a second ejection in the same sport will equal a two-week suspension. Remember, that can carry a huge punishment, especially if you've got a basketball team that over two weeks has got seven games scheduled. And you're going to miss seven contests because that's the minimum is two weeks for your second ejection in basketball. Okay, ejection of coaches. Unlike players, coaches, if you get ejected, you must leave the facility or the stadium immediately and you cannot return. A number of issues in the last few years where coaches have been ejected and they weren't quite sure they had to leave the facility or stadium. We want to make it clear, if you're ejected, you must leave the facility or stadium immediately and not return. No questions asked. Whether you agree with the ejection or you disagree with the ejection. If you're ejected, leave. 
the best thing you can do as a coach when you've been ejected is to stop arguing, stop questioning it, accept it, and move on. In many cases, the minimums for coach ejections and the fine and the suspension are increased once the coach becomes ejected. You can do yourself a huge favor by leaving at that point in time. And remember, as a coach, too, you cannot return to coach at any level until cleared by the league. If you're in a tournament, first game's on a Friday at 8 o'clock at night, and you get ejected, you don't get to go back out there Saturday and just start coaching because you haven't heard from the league office. If you haven't heard from us, that means you haven't been cleared. If you're, and we will not be communicating this with you. We'll be communicating with your AD or principal. So if they've not heard from us, then you're not cleared. And you assume that they haven't heard that you keep sitting out. Changes this year to coach ejections. Executive committee approved in April. The coach ejection will now carry a minimum two-game suspension, and the fine will remain at $300. In the past, the minimum ejection for coaches has been one-game suspension and $300 fine. The minimum game suspension for coaches is increased to two, and the fine will remain at $300. Remember, that fine goes to the school. The school decides they want to make you pay them for it. That's between you and your, your administration at your school. Now, that being a two-game suspension, this is going to be crucial for you because, remember, the suspensions of a coach must be served at the same level where the ejection occurs. If you're a varsity-level head coach or assistant coach and you're ejected from a sub-varsity game, you're going to be fined $300 and you're going to be suspended from the next two sub-varsity games. What that means is you will not be able to coach in any contest until you have served a two-game suspension at the sub-varsity level. For example, you're helping your assistant coach out on a Thursday night, or your JV coach out on a Thursday night. You get ejected from the Thursday night JV contest. Your varsity team plays on Friday. Your varsity team plays Saturday. Your varsity team plays Monday. You won't coach in any of those games. Your JV team plays again on Tuesday. That'll be your first game suspension at the JV level. You will have missed the Friday, the Saturday, and the Monday varsity games. You sit the JV game. Your JV plays again on Thursday. You sit again. And then your varsity team plays on Friday. Now you're eligible to coach because you've served your suspension at the level where it occurs. So you got a two-game suspension at the level it occurred, but you were ineligible to coach in any other contest between there. So essentially, because you were ejected from a sub-varsity game, and because the way your schedule worked out, you actually missed five contests total. Be mindful of that moving forward. There's no reason why varsity coaches should be ever ejected from a sub-varsity game. There's no reason why you should be ejected from a varsity contest. But if you are going to get ejected, understand the consequences of that ejection. And remember, if you're ejected from the final game of the, suspend, of the season, the penalty is a minimum $500 fine. Changes this year to ejections. Actions can get them suspended for up to 365 days. Rules and regulations do not allow any suspension to exceed 365 days. Obviously, 365 days suspension are reserved for severe actions of athlete or athletes or coaches. Rules and regulations also call for any athlete that is suspended for 365 days will result in the program being put on immediate probation, which will take you out of the playoffs immediately. Any athlete that leaves the bench during an altercation, they're going to get ejected from the contest, and that's going to result in a suspension. If they leave the bench during the altercation and they become involved by putting their hands on someone, even if it's in a goodwill gesture to remove them from 
the activity on the floor. If they put their hands on someone from the other team, grab them around the waist, pull them back, shove, punch, they're going to be ejected for multiple games depending on the level of their involvement. As we spoke about in the previous slide, disrespectfully addressing a game official is going to result in beyond the minimum for suspension. Physical contact with a game official is going to be an ejection in up to 365 days, depending on the severity of that contact. I can tell you more often than not, that is going to err more towards a 365-day suspension. The best thing you can do as a coach for your student athletes is to video every contest start to finish. Wide angle camera lens so everything can be seen. Instruct your camera operators to keep the camera running during any altercation. The important part of that is, yes, the ones that are guilty are going to be viewed. We're going to know who's guilty. But the most important thing is those that are innocent are going to be able to be cleared. We want to clear the ones that were not involved. We want to clear the innocent. It also allows us to see the level to which the athlete or the coach was involved without video to review the severity of the actions all we have is what is written up in some cases what is written up exceeds what the athlete actually did in some cases what is written up doesn't meet the actions of what the kid actually did video everything so that we can review it and make sure the appropriate suspension is handled down. Remember, sportsmanship's a choice. Your student athletes make it, your assistant coach make it, and you make it every day. Make it a priority to go through this. Make it a part of what you do daily. Okay, medical information. Reminder, the approved healthcare providers who can return a student athlete to play Anytime it involves a concussion, those five, they all must be licensed in South Carolina, an MD, a DO, an AT, a PA, and an MP. Any one of those five can return a student athlete to play during a contest when symptoms or signs of a concussion are thought to be there. In absence of one of those five, student athlete sent off the field for a concussion-like symptom by an official, that student athlete will remain out for the remainder of the game. Other important medical information for you, just as a reminder, last year we went through and implemented the wet bulb globe thermometer. Please be mindful of that as we get started in the 2019 school year. This does not just apply to outdoor early year activities. This also could be an indoor activity for the early part of the season of the school year and also could be involved in the latter part of the school year when the temperatures begin to rise again. All athletes' physicals must be on file with your school, and the date for that physical to be valid is April 1st of 2019. Any physical dated prior to April 1 of 2019 will not be valid this year for your student athletes. Check with your AD to make sure you have an emergency action plan for your facility, and not only for your facility, but for each sports season. In many cases, you may use the same stadium that another sport uses, but you may not have every access point open to get into that stadium for your sport that another sport would. So just check with your AD to make sure you have an emergency action plan. Make sure you're aware of it, and it's always a good idea to keep a copy with you in the event something were to happen and you're the only person there to be able to make a decision on how to get the emergency vehicles in. All right, tournaments. We've had an issue in the last couple of years with tournaments and a definition of what a tournament is. Just a couple of things to remind you of. All tournaments, invitationals, and jamborees, they must be sanctioned by our office. Once we get it sanctioned and approved for sanctioning, we post that on our website. If you're participating in a tournament, an invitational, or a jamboree, check our website to make sure that it's been approved as a sanctioned tournament. If you participate in a non-sanctioned event or host a non-sanctioned event, you are subject to penalties and or fines. Don't put yourself in position 
to get a penalty and or fine by participating in a non-sanctioned event. Any contest in the preseason must be in a tournament that is sanctioned. We've had to call a few schools this past school year and remind them that you cannot host a round robin invitational in the preseason. If you're going to host an event during that preseason date period, it must be a tournament. That means it must be a series of contests and competition for a championship at which at least first and second place are decided by a final contest. So if you're going to host an event in the preseason, it must be a tournament, it must be sanctioned, and when you submit your application for sanctioning, you must submit your brackets as they are to be played so that we can approve that as an approved tournament. If you have any questions on that, please feel free to call our office and we'll be glad to help guide you through the process to make sure you get it right. Okay, transfers are ineligible players. The responsibility of making sure that every athlete on your court or field is eligible falls on your principal and athletic director. But it's always a good idea for you to remember what a transfer is and what an ineligible player is so that you can get the information to your AD and not place someone in error. A good thing to do is the first day of tryouts or the first day of practice is to check with every person trying out for your team and just ask one simple question. Who was not at our school from the first day so the last day last year and who was not at our feeder middle school from the first day until the last day of the previous year. Anyone who was not at your school day one through the final school day of the year before or at your feeder middle day one through the last school day the year before is considered a transfer. What that means, if they came in day two, enrolled in your school, and stayed till the end of the year, they are still by rule a transfer. If they came in the last week of school, they are a transfer. Do not ask them who was at our school last year. That could potentially put you in a position to play someone who is ineligible due to the transfer rule. Make sure you take time to ask that question Pass that along to your AD as soon as possible. If you know you have an athlete who's participating in preseason workouts months ahead of your season, who was not at your school the entire year last year, or not at your feeder middle school the entire school year before, make your AD aware so that they can start the process of a transfer. And in the event they're ineligible due to the transfer rule, they still have time to look into any options that may exist for eligibility. If you wait till the last minute, you could put that athlete in potential of having to sit out an extended period of time waiting on eligibility. And remember, to be eligible, that transfer must meet one of the criteria for eligible transfers stated in our handbook. Just because someone's a transfer does not make them ineligible. If they meet one of the criteria that makes them an eligible transfer, then they will be eligible. That is up to your AD and principal to determine whether that eligibility exists. And reminders, if they're not eligible for any reason, they cannot participate in a scrimmage, jamboree, or contest. They can practice, but they cannot participate in a scrimmage, jamboree, or contest. Okay, the 75% rule. With the change of the sports season opportunity to practice outside of your sports season with your school team, we've seen an increase in questions from coaches and schools as it pertains to the 75% rule. We've also seen some violations where coaches didn't truly understand the 75% rule. They had a thought of what they perceive it to be. 
I'm going to take a moment to go through the basics of the 75% rule. Reminder, the 75% rule only applies to when a coach from your school is associated with the outside team. This includes all school employees and volunteer coaches. So if they work at your school or they coach at your school, paid or unpaid, assistant or head, if they're coaching an outside team that has your players on it, your student athletes, the 75% rule will apply to that outside team. If you or one of your coaches or one of your employees coaches an outside team with players made up of other schools, from other schools or from other states, 75% rule doesn't apply to you. 75% rule applies to outside teams with returning players who dress for a varsity contest the previous season. If you're coaching an outside team that has players from your school on it, but not one of those players dress for a varsity contest the previous year, then the 75% rule does not apply to you. It only applies when you're coaching an outside team or when a coach from your school or an employee from your school is coaching an outside team that contains returning players who dressed for a varsity contest the previous season. The numbers that you're allowed to have on that team are listed in the rules and regulations. It's not 75% of your outside team roster. The numbers you're allowed to have of players who dressed for a varsity contest the previous season on your outside team is in the rules and regulations. So we'll continue with the 75% rule. Here are some examples. Example one, soccer is allowed eight players on an outside team under the 75% rule. So if you go to the rules and regulations and you look at the number of players allowed per sport on an outside team coached by a coach from your school, a volunteer coach from your school, an assistant coach from your school, or a school employee in the sport of soccer, that outside team is allowed to have eight players on that team who dress for a varsity game during the previous season. So if you're coaching a soccer team as an outside team and you have seven returning players on that team who dress for a varsity game at your school and 11 players who are on the JV season and never dress for a varsity game, that outside team will meet the 75% rule because you did not exceed eight players on that outside team that dressed for your varsity team the previous year. Example two, basketball has allowed three players on an outside team under the 75% rule. The outside team coached by a coach from your school or an employee from your school has four players on it who dressed for a varsity game the previous year and seven players who never dressed for a varsity game. This would be a violation. The reason that's a violation is that basketball has only allowed three players on the outside team that dressed for a varsity contest the previous year. The outside team in this example had four players who dressed for an outside who dressed for the varsity game the previous year and were on the outside team. Therefore, it would be a violation. As always, if you have any questions as to the legality of your varsity team, or your outside team, call our office prior to establishing your outside team. Okay, our final slide before we'll turn it over to your sport commissioner for the rule changes in the FHS rule book is on open and closed season. And a lot of questions on this this past year and seeing a lot of um, coaches who don't fully understand what they can and cannot do during this time. Remember, if it's an open season, during that open season, you have 20 days of practice. That 20 days is for your use, however you want to use it, however many hours you want to go, however many kids you want to have out there. The only requirement is you 
must make it open to all students and it cannot be mandatory for any. If you want to have 200 kids come to your softball practice, great. You only have 20 days with it. During the open season, your school facilities can be used. I have a lot of coaches who aren't sure they can actually use their school facilities during the open season. The open season, 20 days of practice. You to use how you want. School facilities may be used. Open to all students and cannot be mandatory. And a reminder that football and lacrosse, you have pad exemptions during that 20 days that you can actually use pads and days where you cannot use pads. Make sure you pay attention to your sport specific rule if you're in football and lacrosse as it pertains to pads. The closed season. During closed period, a coach cannot work with any athletes. It's on campus or off campus. The only exception to this would be if you're on a, coaching an outside team that has no affiliation with your school. Students are not allowed to use school facilities on their own. Example of this, no open gyms. You can't unlock the gym and say, hey, I can't be in there, but you can go shoot. That's a violation of the closed season. Strength and conditioning activities are allowed. We get a lot of calls. Hey, can we lift weights? Can we run? Can we condition? Absolutely. You can lift weights and run and condition year-round. You just cannot teach sport-specific skills or training during a closed period. Reminder, June and July, they're open for practice. The only exception to that is the dead week around July 4th. And also in June and July, you have 10 dates for team competition in all sports. That wraps up the first part of the, your rules presentation. I want to wish you all best of luck this year. And if always, if, as always, if you have any questions on anything we've covered here or any questions that, on anything that was not covered here, do not hesitate to call our office or have your athletic director call our office. Our number is 803-798-0120. Thank you. Welcome to the 2019 Online Swims Rules Clinic. My name is Skip Lax. I've included on this slide the uh, best way to contact me with an email address as well as phone numbers. I've also listed the websites for the National Federation uh, which will include uh, resources for you, as well as uh, nfhslearn.com, which includes the necessary courses that are required for completion. We will begin with the 2019-20 NFHS Swimming and Diving Rules PowerPoint. Your NFHS rules books are also available for you as eBooks. There's also a new NFHS rules app for you as well. Our guidelines for schools and state associations for consideration of accommodations. Should you have a swimmer that would need or require special accommodations uh, for participation, uh, please refer back to these guidelines in submitting a request to the state office. The following are the rule changes for the 2019-20 swim season. Uniforms, Rule 3-3 has been reorganized to identify penalties for specific uniform violations. No other changes were made to these rules. Rule 3-3-1 recommends that all swimmers and divers wear suits of identical coloring and pattern. Rule 3-3-2 contains all language addressing suit coverage. Suits shall be of one piece. A competitor shall not be permitted to participate wearing a suit that is not of decent appearance. Boys shall wear suits which cover the buttocks and shall not extend above the waist or below the top of the kneecap. Girls shall wear suits which cover the buttocks and breasts and shall not extend beyond the shoulders or below the top of the kneecap nor cover the neck. Penalties. When an official discovers a competitor wearing illegal attire as described in Article 2, the official shall, when observed prior to the start of the heat, notify the coach of the competitor to make the swimsuit legal. When observed after the heat officially begins, disqualify the competitor at the completion of the heat. 
Rule 3-3-3 addresses information that can be placed on the suitor cap, competitor's name, school name, school nickname, or logo, advertising, or name other than permitted, and 3-3-2C is prohibited, size of a single visible manufacturer's logo, trademark, and reference, size of one American flag or memorial patch, the FINA mark, and or individual barcode. Rule 3-3-4 addresses suit construction for swimmers constructed of a woven knit textile material. Must be permeable except for one post construction school name and or logo not to exceed 9 square inches. May not aid buoyancy. May not have fastening systems other than a waist tie for a briefer jammer and elastic material in the terminal ends. Rule 3-3-3 and 3-3-4 penalties when an official discovers a competitor wearing illegal attire as described in Articles 3 and 4, the official shall, when observed prior to the start of the heat, notify the coach or the competitor to make the swimsuit illegal. When observed after the heat, disqualify the competitor at the completion of the heat. The remaining articles have been renumbered. 3-3-5 addresses speed, buoyancy, body compression, and adhesives. Rule 3-3-6 requires coaches to verify that all competitors are legally attired. Regarding finishes, Rule 8-1-7, to finish the race, the swimmer shall contact the finish end in the manner prescribed by the stroke. Rule 1-1-1, the end walls are the walls perpendicular to the race course. Rule 8-2-1G, the backstroke finish requires completion of the required distance in contact with the touch pad or finish end by any part of the swimmer with some part of the body at or above the surface. Rule 8-2-2H, the breaststroke finish requires completion of the required distance in contact with the touch pad or finish end with both hands simultaneously, not necessarily on the same plane. Rule 8-2-3G, the butterfly finish requires completion of the required distance and contact with the touch pad or finish end with both hands simultaneously, not necessarily on the same plane. Rule 8-2-4E, the freestyle finish requires completion of the required distance in contact with the touch pad or the finish end by any part of the swimmer. Rule 8-3-5, each swimmer of a relay team must contact the finish end at the conclusion of his or her leg of the relay in accordance with the finish rule applicable to the stroke being swum. The following are the major editorial changes. Authorized officials, 4-1-2 in championship meets. A meet committee and a meet director shall assume responsibility for all aspects of meet management. The meet committee shall make decisions on matters not specifically covered by the rules or on the misapplication of a rule during a meet. Judgment calls of officials are not subject to review by this committee. The decisions of the meet committee are final. The referee, Rule 4-2-2E, during the meet, the responsibilities of the referee are to notify the competitor's coach of an observed violation of 3-3-2 during competition. This may be accomplished with a verbal announcement if the competitor's coach cannot be reached without a delay of the meet. Following are the points of emphasis. Preventing shallow water blackout, how to avoid shallow water blackout, never hyperventilate, never ignore the urge to breathe, never swim alone, never play breath holding games, no repetitive underwater laps. Suit coverage. Continues to be a focus. Language addressing coverage and the protocol for addressing violations has been reorganized in the rules book. Pre-meet coaches and athlete meetings requires the coach to verify his or her athletes are properly and legally equipped. Recommend that school administrators and coaches address suit coverage with parents and athletes during their preseason meetings. 
accommodations for students with disability updates, updated language for hearing and visual impairments, updated images of official signals for forward and backward starts, backstroke starts, updated images of modified starting positions. All these are available in the 2019 NFHS Swimming Officials Guidelines Manual. Sub-varsity competition, state associations may modify events and distances for non-varsity competition. NFHS playing rules are written specifically for varsity competition. Modifications for levels other than varsity are at the discretion of the state association. Pre-meet conference and situations where conducting a pre-meet conference is impractical. State associations may determine an alternative method of compliance. Topics that should be covered are listed in the NF NFHS Swimming Officials Guidelines Manual. Must provide appropriate information for athletes, coaches, and meet officials to assure that the stated purposes for the pre-meet conference are met. NFHS Officials Education. There are sports-specific officiating, officiating courses offered through the NFHS in a variety of sports. Uh, covered uh, at nfhslearn.com. The NFHS Officials Association Central Hub is a great resource containing sports information, rules information, a rules library, searchable rules book, and video content on officiating. The NFHS Learning Center. The NFHS Learning Center provides professional development for all coaches, officials, administrators, parents, students, performing arts. Coaching Swimming is a course offered through the Federation uh, developed with NISCA. This concludes the online rules clinic for swim. Thank you and have a great season.